is a recent doctoral graduate in public policy and political science from the University of Michigan, Go Blue. In 2013, she was inspired to dress as Rosie the Riveter to bring attention to the campaign to save the Willow Run bomber plant. She did this out of love for Michigan history and to honor her grandfather, who was a mechanic on B-24s with the 458th Bomber Group in England during World War II. Allison stood at a busy intersection in Ann Arbor and held up a sign encouraging traffic to honk if they wanted to save Rosie's factory. This spurred a wave of local pride and enthusiasm about Rosie the Riveter that contributed to the Yankee Air Museum's ability to purchase a portion of the factory. Since then, Allison has helped lead a team of fellow tribute Rosie the Riveters in hundreds of events in Michigan and around the country, including air shows, parades, festivals, tea parties, Guinness World Record events, and many more. The Rosies, so named because they pay tribute to the original Rosies who worked in World War II, are goodwill ambassadors for the Yankee Air Museum and endeavor to inspire enthusiasm for Willow Run's incredible history to everyone they meet. She encourages you to visit yankeeairmuseum.org to see all the amazing ways you can team up with the Rosies and the museum to preserve history and inspire future generations. So, to give us more on the story of Rosie the Riveter, I give you Allison Beatty, and please share your slides and let's get started. Thank you, Bob. Such a nice introduction, and it's really an honor to be here today. And let me see, is that full screen? Just bear with me. Rosies are always learning new skills. Bob, is that full screen now? I'm going to assume that it is. Um, You're good. Yeah, let me know if there are any problems. Okay, great. So for those of you who tuned in last week, you saw another amazing presentation about the arsenal of democracy from Mr. Kripke. And I am happy to say um, everything that he said is great and I learned new stuff as well. So my part of um, the part of my presentation that deals with the origins of Willow Run, I'm gonna condense that a little bit and then spend more time looking at the pictures of the women who are working in the factory. So part one, origin story. And this story really revolves around the father-son relationship between Henry Ford and Edsel Ford. And Henry Ford would not let Edsel fight in World War I, even though he was of age and he really wanted to because a lot of his um, friends were going off and fighting. But Henry said, no, you're going to take over one of the biggest companies in the world. You're not gonna go die in a trench in France somewhere. And so Edsel, um, he did not go to fight. He did become president of Ford Motor Company at the tender age of 26 and went on to lead an incredible career. Um, but he always felt bad that he was not able to participate in the war with his um, cohort of men at that age. So when World War II came around, Edsel, who was good friends with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his father Henry was not so good of friends, they were kind of on opposite political sides. Um, Edsel asked President Roosevelt, what can Ford Motor Company do to help with um, the, the rising war concerns? And what Roosevelt said was that we need airplanes. At that time, the US um, armed air, or allied air forces or the, the United States, what became known as the Air Force, ranked 17th, or oh, even says 18th in the world behind Romania. We had 1,700 flyable aircraft in 1939. Germany had more than twice as many. And can you think now what that would mean to you if the United States was not the strongest air force in the world, some other air force, from a potentially hostile nation that had twice as large of an arm, an air force as we do, it wouldn't be a very comfortable feeling. So Roosevelt said, we need you to focus on airplanes. And specifically, this was because they knew that in order to defeat Nazi Germany, they would have to eventually wage an offensive war. Winston Churchill knew that as early as 1941, you would have to invade in order to win. And for invasions, you need air force. You need somebody laying down all of that fire, the bomb runs um, in order to get the land invasions into the capital. And this is the aircraft that um, Roosevelt asked the Ford Motor Company to specialize in. This is the B-24 Liberator Bomber. And as Mr. Kripke said last week, it could fly further, it could carry a higher, uh, a larger payload. It was often more accurate um, than the other aircraft that were flying at that time. Um, it was faster as well. And so this, um, it's kind of 
and it's not considered a pretty looking aircraft and it wasn't considered fun to fly, but you can recognize it because it's got four engines, two on each side, that very unique tail, which you can see on the right, which um, enabled it to get into smaller hangars by having those squat tail fins, but um, it also made it a lot harder to steer. And then it also has a um, very distinctive snub nose in front. And um, at the time, this was being built by Consolidated Manufacturing Company out in California. And they were doing each one custom built. So Ford sent his engineering team um, out to California to look at what Consolidated was doing. It was led by Charlie Sorensen, Cast Iron Charlie. He was an immigrant from Denmark who worked his way up through Ford Motor Company to become vice president of production. And he had that same genius for automotive assembly lines that Henry Ford did. And he said, oh my gosh, well, we can do this a lot better. And Consolidated said, well, how could you do that better? And he said, I don't know, but I'm gonna figure it out. And so he went back to his hotel room and uh, he drew allegedly the earliest designs for Willow Run on hotel stationery. And this picture on the right is, according to legend, one of those photographs, or one of those drawings that he did on that very first night. And what they, they decided to do was to apply the automotive assembly um, manufacturing styles that made Detroit the automotive center of the uh, entire country, not just the nation, but the world, um, to building aircraft, to make every single part the same and interchangeable, um, so that if one aircraft's left wing broke down and the other one's right wing, they could take one of those pieces and still create one flyable aircraft instead of the custom made parts that Consolidated was doing that made it so that when one airplane got um, shot up, it had to be jumped if it couldn't be replaced. So this is what the factory ended up looking like. Um, as you can see, they had to build um, additional parts in both the beginning and at the end. And eventually they had a full mile of assembly lines inside the factory um, in, in the form of two tracks that would run parallel to each other. And you can almost see sort of like a mid, a dorsal line in the middle of this um, blueprint that bisects the factory. And that represents um, the two assembly lines. And they broke ground in 1941, and they were even starting to build airplanes before they finished the final doors, which are um, pictured here in June of 1942. And um, it's amazing how quickly they could build what became the largest building in the world when it was built, um, versus how, like, how much care and how much time it takes to restore something of this. But within a, almost a year, they had the whole thing um, up and running. It became the largest building under one roof, with the Rouge factory, of course, being the largest building complex in the world, and was soon eclipsed by the Pentagon um, about a year later. So 3.5 million square feet, and then the Pentagon 5 million square feet. And the first B-24 um, rolled off the line in June of 1942, and you saw those doors. Those doors weren't even finished, and they were already building these aircraft. And then um, it had a lot of problems at first. All of the engineers that were being used at Ford were used to building cars, and cars have different tolerance specifications than airplanes that have to take off at very high velocity, go up to altitude, and deal with massive temperature and pressure changes up and down. Um, another problem was that the test pilots and all of the army, um, the army heads of staff were coming back with suggestions about how to tweak this way and that way, and so instead of having um, like one, one model, they kept trying to add different things. Um, so the factory was originally nicknamed Will It Run um, because the aircraft themselves were fairly unreliable. But what they decided to do was um, start doing generations, basically. They had the A model, the B model, and everybody would submit their changes, and then that was it. No more changes until the next model came out. And eventually, they really worked through all of those kinks and problems that they had to create very dependable, high-quality aircraft. And as you can see, Charles Lindbergh, he was another pacifist, and he has Detroit heritage. Maybe you could have another presentation about that. He was not hireable um, in the Army Air Forces, so Henry Ford said, come work for us. You're the best aviator in the country. And he helped test fly the B-24 bombers. Ultimately, um, like I said, they got their problems straightened out, and they built over 8,860 bombers, over half of all B-24 bombers built for the war out of five other factories, um, so or four other factories, there were five total. One of them, Willow Run, produced half of all of the B-24s used in the war. And they did get it down to where one bomber was rolling out the doors every 55 minutes, which is where we get the legend that Henry Ford swore he would build a bomber an hour, and indeed he did.
Stephen Ambrose, he wrote Band of Brothers and is a noted historian of American history, said it would be an exaggeration to say that the B-24 won the war for the Allies, but don't ask how they could have won the war without it. And here you have a picture of Ford's 6,000th bomber coming off the line with presumably several of the women who helped make it. And a factory of this size, the largest building in the world, big enough to have its own zip code, obviously had massive labor demands as well. And with all of the men going off to fight, it would have been impossible to run this factory without women. But at this time, using women was considered crazy. There was a couple of examples um, before now, women did go to work a little bit in World War I. There were also um, women who were working in Ford's factories um, on automotive things in peacetime. But there were just as many um, pieces of literature and scientific information about how women were too constitutionally feeble to handle like, the stress and the strain of working in the factories. However, um, people quickly changed their minds when it became a necessity. The people in this picture, this is um, Edsel Ford on the far right, Charlie Sorensen, who you saw in that earlier picture, and William Knudsen, probably many of you recognize him, president of General Motors. And then he became the lieutenant general in charge of all um, home front military production during World War II. And I like to think that this is the moment that they came together and realized that they would have women running this factory. And by 1943, uh, a survey from the US Department of Labor found that women were being used extensively for most jobs. So it was amazing to see how quickly necessity pushed all of the old myths about women's capability of working in the factories right out the window. Willow Run put up advertising all around the country asking people to come work. And this is a very, very detailed poster. But if you find a copy on the internet and you read it, you'll see that almost every line is very fascinating. They show um, inexperienced persons will be given eight weeks of training with pay, transportation paid. They talk about um, federal housing that was available. But as you know, if you saw the previous presentation, that didn't quite pan out as well as everybody had hoped. Um, they had the wages here, and a uh, dollar an hour was what was generally promised and advertised after you finished your training, and that translates to fifteen eighty in twenty twenty dollars. So that was a pretty good deal. And women responded to this, and they responded in droves. And at Yankee Air Museum, we have interviewed several of the original Rosie Riveters, and hearing their stories about what decided or what made them decide to get into a wartime manufacturing job is always fascinating. One of them said, I went to the hiring office the day I graduated high school. Uh, we met a couple who dropped out of high school and sort of fudged their ages a little bit. One of them said, my brother was drafted and when he went off to war, I decided I was going to war too. And she ultimately made 20 millimeter shells um, that were shot by the man who became her husband in the Navy, um, which is a wonderful story. One of them said, we flipped a coin to go to California or Michigan. Another one said that um, they thought that they were heading to, um, they were coming from Montana and they went east and they thought that Willow Run was in Detroit. So they actually overshot Ypsilanti and they had to turn around and get back to Ipsy to go to Willow Run. And of course, many of them have said things like, I just wanted to do anything I could to help end the war and bring my family home. Honoring service was very important to those women as it is today. So you can see that many of the um, posters that were helping to get women into the factories both reflected their feelings of service and also encouraged it. Um, it's an interesting example of they were how they were both um, setting the scene and also reflecting what was already existent in the population at that time. So my girl's a wow, that's a women ordinance worker or the girl that he left behind is still behind him, she's a wow. Um, build them right, join the RCAF, attack on all fronts. Um, the, the propaganda at this time was fairly inspiring, I would say. And you might be wondering, is a Rosie only somebody who knew how to rivet? And of course, um, the answer is that the definition of a Rosie is much broader. The American Rosie the Riveters Association says that a Rosie is any woman who is employed in an industry or agency related to the war effort or employed in a capacity usually held by a man, which would release that man for service. So it includes um, like uh, architecture or as they say farming or working in metallurgy um, or drafting like many 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 women qu qualify or count as Rosie the Riveters um, so we do a disservice by saying that it's only women who rivet but of course um, that was the catchphrase that helped get women into the factories so that's what we use today and women really did a great job. And I'm sure that their numbers were what helped smash all of the myths about women not being able to work in factories. 
women increased their manufacturing employment by 140% and in specifically by 462% uh, for defense industries. Um, and 75% of the women who joined were brand new to manufacturing. And yet look at what they produced. They produced the armaments that led to the allies being able to win the war. So clearly they did a good job. We know that women of color worked at Willow Run. Um, there was lots of discrimination against these women and we don't have very many testimonies explaining exactly what it was like for them. Um, the Fair Employment Practices Commission banned discrimination in 1941, but there are still plenty of examples of women who are not willing to work with women of color and other sorts of discrimination. We would love to find more history and more testimonials um, on these subjects. So if you know anyone who has a grandmother or a great aunt who might have worked at Willow Run or anywhere else um, or has like left behind papers or memories, please get in touch with Yankee Air Museum. We'd love to hear more. Women of all ages were working in the factories. So we broke down um, stereotypes about um, age and restrictions on the ages of women who could be employed. Here is a woman with gray hair who is working on sewing and you can tell by her badge. I've got a similar badge. Um, that's a Willow Run employee badge. Um, the percentage of women employed over the age of 44 or 45 grew by 54%. Um, and the percentage of women over the age of 55 grew by 50%. Uh, married women were also uh, allowed um, to come back to work, or should I say broke down the stereotype that they could no longer be useful. You can see from this picture of this woman who's soldering that she's got um, an engagement ring and a wedding band. And they, you, can, you can see also that the, um, like the propaganda machine worked to overcome the stereotype that women who were married had to leave the workforce and stay at home. Here's a sign that says, my husband wants me to do my part. So you can see that this is still um, a little bit of a male centric, like my husband is giving me permission, I'm allowed to go on the workforce, right? But once all of these women did go into the workforce, the genie was out of the bottle and you can't put it back in. Everybody knew that married women could do just as well as unmarried women in the factory. Mothers as well. The percentage of mothers with young children grew by 55%, or percentage of mothers with young children in the workforce, I should say. And children, oh, I can see that the text runs over there a little bit. Sorry about that. Childcare was not often provided. World War II was the first, um, the first circumstance where uh, federal childcare and like group childcare became much more common. So anyway, some communities provided services um, and some government uh, services for childcare started as well. And you can see here's another advertisement where they're really playing up the glory, um, the matriarchal glory of a woman who is a mother going into the factory and raising her daughter the same way. As far as uh, numbers of women, Rosie the Riveters at Willow Run, there were 40,000 workers at the factory at any one time, which is just incredible to even imagine 40,000 people in one place. A quarter to a third of all employees were female by 1943, which is about 10 to 12,000. This matches pretty similarly with what Mr. Kripke said. He said about 39%, so I think um, our numbers match, which is great. By the end of the war, 80,000 people had been employed at Willow Run and almost 40% had been women, which was 32,000 women at Willow Run alone. And amazingly, we had very few reports of friction. Most of the original Rosies that we've interviewed who worked at Willow Run said that it was a very good experience and that everybody was mostly pushing for the same outcome, which was victory for the Allies. I'm sure that there might have been other um, stories that have been forgotten or swept under the rug, but for the most part, it seems like people really accepted the Rosies who came to work and that they proved that they could do as good, if not better, of a job. They had equal pay um, in theory as well. There was a way to get around this, which was um, reclassifying a job where women needed some sort of assistance, like with lifting a heavier object or pushing a heavier object, so they, they suddenly called that a different job and you got less wages. But in theory, um, they did have equal pay and it was much higher wages than most of them were used, used to. So now I'm gonna go through some pictures real quickly. Um, here is a riveting and bucking partnership. And um, so riveting requires two people usually. And I've got uh, some example rivets for you here. Um, you have the rivet is like a mushroom. You stick it between two pieces of material. I don't know if you can see that that's two pieces. And then you squeeze the mushroom and it sort of squishes out on the other end. So on the front, I've got the top. This is where the rivet gun would press. And on the bottom, you have the counterforce, which is called um, a bucking bar. 
got a great name, I know. Um, and so you can see these women, so she's got the rivet gun and she's pushing on the mushroom and then the, um, the bucking partner is holding the counterweight and like squishing it together and um, going all the way down that panel. And this is a picture of what really set uh, Ford Motor Company and the arsenal of democracy apart because this is a panel that most likely was moving up and down so that those women didn't have to like stand up or crouch down. They pretty much just stood in the same place the panel moved and they were able to complete their job much faster and then most likely it moved along as well on the assembly line. So there's a row of riveters working. Here's another riveter who's soldering and if you take another uh, a close look at her bandana it's pretty swell. Um, she's obviously got a lot going on on that bandana. I just love it. Um, women were champion inspectors. It turns out um, that the proportion of women who became who, who started as inspectors and then the number of women who like earned the role of inspectors almost exponentially during the war and I learned this from uh, Emeritus Charles High from Wayne State University and he postulates that the reason that this was so is that because women were not willing to let their side by with slipshod work um, they were new in the factories they had a reputation to uphold and they also have an eye for quality and detail so women did very well in inspecting sewing was a vital job too You've probably heard the phrase about, you know, if you can mix a cake, then you can make an airplane or whatever. But um, it also some of the jobs that they were just good at at home were very useful as well. So here is a schematic of a B-24 and these arrows point to um, surfaces, control surfaces that were actually made of lightweight but very stiff fabric. Um, the ailerons and then also the horizontal stabilizers were made of fabric. So if you look at the, on the far left, you see how rounded the tail fin is. And then you look at this picture, you can see that rounded shape, um, which is probably what she is sewing right there. And if you look in the background in that picture, you can also see another elderly woman who um, is just proving that uh, age restrictions were thrown out the window at that time. And then uh, many, many states afterwards included um, discrimination against age in their human rights um, and code of conduct laws. Here's a picture of um, people taking a break. I feel this is a very staged picture um, because you have the severe foreman like looking over the ladies to make sure they're hydrating properly. And if you zoom in on the text there, you can see it's salt pills or the original Gatorade. Um, the tablets replace chemicals lost by the body in excessive sweating. Take one four times daily with water. I'm sure everyone followed those instructions to the letter and there were no problems. Um, little people, as Mr. Kripke said, um, here they are meeting Charlie Sorensen, and they had an exceptionally important role, which was working inside the wings. Um, and they could get into these small places that nobody else could, and they could provide that counterweight um, that was needed for riveting. And you can see um, uh, several, you can see the back sides of rivets, just like I showed you, um, up to uh, above his forehead there. Um, so that is an example of what little people were able to do that nobody else could and why all hands were needed um, for this war effort. Here are women um, working on the controls for the airplane at the front. And I like to try to make people guess um, where they are, but I'll just tell you, they're, they're in the cockpit right there. You can see the levers, the four that say B refer to break. The, the, the four in the middle that say T refer to throttle, and then the four on the right refer to mixture. That's an M, um, and there are four engines, so four for, one for each. And here it is, much further along. You can see the yokes, you can see the rudder pedals, and these women presumably entered the factory without a degree in electrical engineering, but they were making airplanes that were flight worthy um, with a month's training. It's really incredible, very empowering for these women, and they did a great job. Here's a woman in the um, Women's Army Corps, and we know this is at Willow Run, but I don't know a lot about the history of women um, wax at Willow Run, so I'm hoping to learn more about that. And you can tell that she has a little bit of seniority because she has um, a lieutenant bar and also the braid on her collar, or sorry, on her wrist, um, and she's got a secretary. So um, Women's Army Corps is also doing a lot. And here's a picture of the cafeteria. Women were running the cafeteria. If you can bake a cake, you can bake a cake at Willow Run for hungry workers. And I like to think that that's a dessert cart, um, like full of strudel and cake and cobbler and delicious things. Um, but most of the original Rosies that we've talked to actually brought their own lunches. They were very thrifty as they were children of the Depression. And one of them talks about how her favorite lunch was a peanut butter and dill pickle sandwich. And I still have yet to try that, but I really want to. It sounds so interesting. 
um, here they are making sloppy joes, I think, or some sort of like meat sandwich. And if you look in the upper right hand corner, you can see a box that says Wonder Bread. So if you head to the store and buy a loaf of Wonder Bread, you are paying homage to a historical food product. Here's a Rosie taking a break. You can see the iconic lunchbox at her feet. Lunchbox right there. Um, and you can also see that she's got a pin on her jacket and that's a, um, a flyable, I believe it's a Catalina, um, an, a, like a seaplane, which was also being built by women around the country. And that magazine, if you zoom in on it, is actually a Time Life magazine about women in the factory. So it's like a, kind of like the Land O'Lakes butter picture. She's a woman working in the factory reading about other women working in the factory. And she's got her name badge as well. Um, espionage was a huge concern. Um, especially in Detroit, because we were the, um, the material capital of the country. People were very worried that spies from Japan and Germany were here trying to learn all of our um, production secrets. So they had the name badges, they made sure to, um, you, you were told at the beginning that your lunchbox could be searched, um, if, like to and from, to make sure you weren't borrowing tools. Um, it was a very big um, concern at that time. Great picture as well. We had female test pilots. They were, um, none of them were employed directly by Willow Run, but right next door um, at present day DTW, Romulus Army Airfield, was the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, which then became enveloped in, into the WASPs, the Women's uh, Air Force Service Pilots, which is um, kind of more well known among history buffs. And to be in the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, which was the first squadron to come along and had much higher um, qualifications, you needed 500 hours of flying time at a minimum to be qualified to fly on a bomber. And um, the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron was led by Nancy Harkness Love, who was a native of Michigan. She grew up in Houghton, and um, she actually came back here many times over her life. So it's possible that these are WAFs um, from Romulus coming over to check out these bombers. And we don't really have any evidence of um, women flying bombers right out of the doors at Willow Run but there are several women who are qualified to fly B-24s um, and thousand, well, at least a couple thousand women, um, like 1,500, who were flying um, aircraft for the military during World War II, which then broke down the doors to the following um, accomplishments that women have made, like the Navy just having its first um, black female fighter pilot, um, they announced this week. Just to the legacy of Willow Run. A quote from William Knudsen, who we saw earlier, we won because we smothered the enemy in an avalanche of production, the like of which he had never seen nor dreamed possible. And in my opinion, and in many of the opinions of the people who study this subject, this was possible because of the 6.7 million Rosie the Riveters who left their homes and came to do a job that everyone had told them they were not capable of doing in the past. Rosie has become a worldwide symbol of empowerment um, we have Shonda Rhimes, we have Beyonce, we have a quote in Korean that I don't know. We have Pink, um, the mechanic from the, the new Star Wars saga, her name is Rose. I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, we have wall art all over the, um, the one on the uh, far left there, that's Malala Yousafzai, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, we have uh, this in the lower left-hand corner, uh, murals have popped up of Rose writing uh, COVID-19, which kind of brings me to the fact that, I mean, I have just been absolutely astonished and quite inspired by how Rosie the River for World War II has become so prominent to fight this pandemic, because I've always said, and I'm like, I'm scooping my own presentation here, um, what the Rosies did is incredible, not only for what they accomplished for the times that they were living, but how they inspire us to go do challenging things that we face today that we don't have the answers to either. And lo and behold, it's coming true. People are looking at what they did then, what they did in Michigan, in the heritage area for the Motor City to inspire this global response. It's just incredible. Um, Rosie became the subject of several editorials um, to try to help people get inspired, especially with making masks. And then I literally started trying to find the variations on the Rosie the Riveter theme and just gave up because there were too many. Um, but here's 10 of them. So you can see that it's really taken off. So Yankee Air Museum is saving a portion of Willow Run to preserve this legacy because clearly this legacy still has mileage in it, right? And this is what it's what these women did, our mothers, our aunts, our great aunts, what they did right here 
that gives this symbol so much power around the world, more today than ever before. And we want to preserve that so we can help inspire people forevermore. And to do that, we have rescued um, the portion of Willow Run that you can see in the blue etched box in that picture. Um, it was really, it's only about four or five percent of the, the factory, but trust me, it's enough. When you go inside, you think it's cavernous, uh, you think it's the whole factory. And the factory was pretty run down when we got it. Um, one and a half walls were exposed to the open air, so it was getting snow, it had animals, it had the utilities for an entire city. The, um, uh, scaled down, but we have to save it. Um, we have to keep this leg. You can see how inspiring this is to people all over the world in sports um, for coding Disney's Code Rosie 2.0. Um, this is our legacy. This is what we gave the world, and uh, we're going to make sure that we protect it. And so that's what the Tribute Rosies do. We are here to help. We're the Goodwill Ambassadors of Willow Run, and our mission is to inspire people and help them learn about this incredible heritage. Um, we visit places, I'm sorry, I guess a little fast, this, visiting the Rouge factory um, with a Rosie who had worked there, the one who's standing up, and the Rosie who's sitting down worked at Willow Run, the two who are in the red jackets, of course, we are honoring them. We're also in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, um, Detroit's Thanksgiving Day Parade, in order to show the world where Rosie country is. We set two Guinness World Records. Um, we know that the, uh, our um, esteemed colleagues in California were considering retaking the record this summer. I think that's been uh, put off for a little bit. So we're still in the lead. If they ever again, we're going to need your help. And it was a really fun day. And you can see people brought their, um, their young girls to inspire them to say they'd been part of something great. And also they brought posters to honor um, their relatives who are Rosies who might not longer be with us anymore. And we had the, the cars and the trucks came to Rosie up. There's a polka dot bandana for UAW truck. And then there's um, the uh, Ypsilanti Township. Their fire trucks have Rosie the Riveter imagery on them. So this is my call to action. We need to recognize the heroic contributions of the women in Michigan in World War II. We need to preserve this history so that we stay inspired by it um, through thick and thin, just like now. And we need to change Will Run from being a well-kept secret to a global symbol of success. I feel like so many of the things about Michigan that are great are under the radar. And literally, that's why there's a TV show called Under the Radar about Michigan. This should not be under the radar. Let's work together to, um, to change that. And there's lots that you can do along those lines. The museum is open and we are ready to welcome you when you are ready to visit. And you can look online for um, all of the safety procedures that they've put in place. There's actually, the bomber plan is going to be open um, uh, July 25th and September 26th. You can see all of the Cold War flyables that are stored in there right now. Um, and you can also get a taste of World War II history. You can also fly on our World War II flyable aircraft built by Rosie the Riveter. Um, this summer, we have two that are up and running, the B-17 and the C-47, but there are three other really amazing aircraft that you can also fly on as well. Um, you can also donate to honor somebody your family um, and together we can preserve the legacy of the people who came before us and inspire future generations to behave and to rise to the challenges that they faced just as the greatest generation did. And this is a Rosie the Riveter who is still making masks. She lives in Philadelphia. She's quite a firecracker um, and she just never stops and I want to be like her when I grow up. Um, Another thing you can do is visit the website. We have a creativity hanger um, so that kids can start getting involved and in learning about the story and also learning about how cool aviation is. And aviation is a huge part of the Motor Cities Heritage Area. I think we have um, something like, we're in the top 10 at least, if not the top five for the most aerospace engineers in the country. So this is part of Michigan's heritage too. Whatever it is, together we can do it. So that's my presentation. Thank you all so much for listening to me talk about Rosie the Riveter today. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Allison. That was fantastic. Um, I actually have a couple questions and I know we have, uh, if, if you, if, and if you have questions for Allison, uh, please use the Q and A icon at the lower portion of the screen and add your questions. Uh, but I saw a picture in there of Rose Will Monroe, and I don't think a lot of people know her story. So I'm wondering if you can fill in the group on who she uh, was. Thank you for referencing her photo. I forgot, and I should probably add that into the presentation. 
Rose Will Monroe is the Rosie the Riveter that gives Willow Run the claim of being home to the original Rosie the Riveter because she was the one who was the focus of Walter Pigeon's propaganda video trying to get more women into the factories. She was a, um, a widow, a young widow at the age of I think 22 or 24 with two kids. She saw a um, poster that was advertising jobs in Willow Run um, that I showed you, that big um, like beige poster. And she decided to go up and get a good job here because a lot of times women were making like five cents an hour, like, like astonishingly low late wages, especially in Appalachia. And um, when she came here, she got a job. She was very good with tools because allegedly her father was a carpenter. And so he had sort of taught her growing up. And a lot of times people will do by saying like, go get me a left-handed wrench or something like that. And really they're all the same. Um, so she saw right through all of that stuff. She did a great job. She was a riveter, um, and so when she was working on riveting airplane wings, they thought this would be perfect because the song Rosie the Riveter by the Vagabonds was already extremely popular. Um, so she became the subject of the documentary, and that's why Yankee Air Museum's earlier, um, like, Save the Bomber Plant, um, uh, like, leaflets and pamphlets and stuff said, home to the original Rosie the Riveter. And of course, since then, we've really embraced the whole idea that more everybody, all of the women who are doing their part um, are Rosie the Riveters. So now we, we like to think that we're home to the spirit of Rosie the Riveter as well. Thank you, that's great. Another one of my questions was actually echoed by Russ Doré. Um, what is the WOW, does WOW stand for something? The W-O-W, is that an acronym? It is, it stands for Women Ordinance Worker. And the uh, Eastern Detroit chapter of the American Rosie the Riveter Association is actually named in honor for them. So if you want to look that up, you can see, I think because the president of that chapter, um, her grandmother was a wow, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that they actually refer to themselves that way as wows, um, which is really cute. Excellent. Um, we do have a question from Bill Greenwood. And um, he is asking about some of the photos that you shared uh, give the impression that the women worked in isolation. Um, did women and men work together or, or not work together in teams in terms of uh, at Willow Run? They did everything. So the Rosie that shared the story about the peanut butter and dill pickle sandwich, she often said that she worked with teams of men. And I've heard others who have as well. But I think you're right. There are probably a lot of times where they worked in isolation because I can't imagine how many men um, would have been qualified even to sew those um, fabric coverings for the aircraft. So I imagine that like that department was probably pretty much only women. It was a mix of both. Okay. Um, are there uh, any upcoming events uh, at, at the Yankee Air Museum scheduled for later this year? I know the museum is, is back open. Yeah, there are several. Again, um, I would heartily encourage you to attend the Cold War um, storage, Cold War Warriors um, events that they're having in July and September. Um, they are also doing um, like air ventures. So you can just uh, sign up and come to take a ride on those aircraft or just come to like bask in the glory of the hangar. Um, there's an opportunity to meet the Vietnam era Huey helicopter that um, they just, this is its first year that it's gonna be flying, or I, I don't know if it is flying this summer, um, but either way, it's a really cool aircraft. It has combat history and it's named for the um, Greyhound, uh, the Greyhound coach company, like that, that, that squadron was called the Greyhound. So they wrote to the Greyhound motor coach company and asked if they could borrow their logo. And Greyhound was like, sure, and here's hundreds of pounds of care packages besides, like, you guys are doing um, good work. Thank you very much for your service. And so the yeah, helicopter has a beautiful Greyhound logo on it, um, and you can come see that and fly in it soon. And then another event that's happening is um, you can come meet the Trimotor um, in a speakeasy. And if you saw Mr. Kripke's presentation last week, um, a trimotor is uh, one of Ford's most famous aircraft of all time. It's completely metal, corrugated metal sides. Yankee Air Museum just purchased a trimotor from a private donor and soon it will be flyable, probably next season, I think. Um, but we're having a speakeasy in September. I think it's September 19th. You should check the website. It's just gonna be in the hangar and you can meet the trimotor and maybe dress up and have a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, looks like uh, D 
Deborah has a question uh, about the the Pigeon promo film. Do you have any idea if that film with Rose Mil Will Monroe is available to view anywhere? Is it on YouTube? Do you have any any idea? So I've heard that it's in the National Archives. Um, Walter Pigeon has dozens of boxes of un like viewed footage in the National Archives, and um, we worked to um like uncover those boxes and get to them but we haven't had a lot of success yet um so i'm not sure you should if you could um join the hunt and try to find it that would be epic okay um can you elaborate a little bit more on african-american uh women and african-american rosies working at willow run yes um i I don't know how many there are, and I can point you to the resource that will be able to tell you. That would be Charles Hyde's book, Arsenal of Democracy. You know, there are two books called Arsenal of Democracy. One of them is by A.J. Bame, and that's the one that reads like uh, Truman Capote's in Blood. It reads like a thriller novel. But you want the one that has, um, that was written by Professor Charles Hyde, because that has all the facts and the numbers. Um, so we know that uh, Black women made up a minority of workers at Willow Run, but they were definitely there. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk about whether or not the bathrooms are segregated, but we have original Rosies who remember like using the bathrooms with um, Black Rosies as well. So there's really a lot of like myth and mystery surrounding um, the women who worked there. And I think that's about all I know, unfortunately. But I can also add that um, the Rouge Factory has many, many photos um, and very good archival footage of um, black and white Rosies working together um, on different projects. So that factory, at least, was ahead of its time. And we hope that Willow Run was similar. We just don't know. OK. Um, I have a question from uh, Renee. Um, how many other states or cities had plants? Um, I asked because I spoke to an original Rosie named Rose Lucarelli, who was from Ohio, and she installed bulbs in cockpits uh, somewhere in the state of Ohio. Um, and she also notes in, in, in passing that she met you and your Rosie group at the uh, Pontiac, Michigan holiday parade, and she's a volunteer for the Pontiac Transportation Museum that's being built right. in Pontiac. Well, so, thank, thank you. you. That's an excellent question. <laughs> and I hope that we get to visit the Pontiac Transportation Museum soon. Um, there were factories all over the country. This was truly a national phenomenon. And one thing that amazes me is that if you go anywhere around the country, they're sort of like they have their own spin on it. Like our spin is the aviation side. But if you go down to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, their spin is like, well, this is where we made the, um, you know, we enriched uranium for atomic bombs here. So this is where the war was won. But really, it was everybody working together. And they had hundreds of thousands of women working in um, Oak Ridge as well, or at least dozens of thousands. So it was national. I'm not at all surprised that you met an original Rosie from Ohio. And that's awesome. I know, some, like, okay, so pretty fact. Um, that Mr. Kripke talked about last week, that had Rosie's. Um, there were Rosies who were making Corsair fighter airplanes in Buffalo. Um, the Glenn Martin uh, Aviation Museum in Maryland, um, I don't remember what they were making there, but they had Rosies there. And then also um, Rosie, the, the national Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront Victory Park is in California because that's where the Rosies made Liberty ships. So the World War II story is very like Liberty ship focused there. Excellent. Um, I got a great question. Um, it's those posters, you used a lot of posters in uh, your presentation. And do you know, are there reprints of, of those posters? Are there any of them available that people can actually buy reprints of the posters? Or does the Yankee Air Museum uh, gift shop? Uh, I hope so. I I'm sure you can find somebody who wants to. Oh, um, but I can say that the, there are very high quality reprints of Willow Run um, hiring posters in the Yankee Air Museum gift shop because we went and um, like we cleaned up the images that were online um, so that the text is a lot more readable. So if that's the one you're looking for, head to Yankee Air Museum. The others, I'm sure you can. I hope you can. Um, this is one of my favorite posters for the Liberator Bombers. Um, and that's, this I found in downtown Ypsilanti. So. Okay. 
Well, Allison, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. You've done a great job. And I want to thank you for uh, sharing the wonderful story of Rosie the Riveter with us today. Brian, if you could just put up my, uh, my final couple slides, we will talk a little bit about next week. But before I, I leave the Rosie the Riveter and the Arsenal Democracy concept, I will also, again, uh, I do this a lot, uh, direct you to the MotorCities.org website. We have a page about the Arsenal Democracy right you can access it right from the home page um, we've also drawn it and paralleled it to the fight ag uh, against COVID-19 uh, a lot of people have referred to that as the arsenal of health and so there is an arsenal of democracy slash arsenal of health page uh, that you can learn more about uh, our auto industry and how it pivoted to help fight COVID-19 and there's a lot of resources available from partner attractions like Yankee Air Museum that you can access on that page. Uh, a lot of great uh, stories both from Arsenal Democracy and Arsenal of Health. Uh, next week we are going to have a presentation. This is going to be our first real panel discussion. Instead of uh, just one speaker we're going to have a, an entire panel and it's going to be drawing attention to a, a new part of our website that's going to be uh, coming online in the next uh, week or so. It's our Southwest Detroit Auto Heritage Guide. And that is going to be one week from today on Thursday, July 23rd. Again, our start time is noon Eastern Daylight Time. You can register for that presentation under the Motor Cities at Home button right on our homepage at MotorCities.org. Um, Brian Yap, who is our Director of Programs and Operations, is going to be moderating that panel discussion. I don't know, Brian, if you want to uh, say a couple quick words about next week's presentation or the Southwest Detroit Auto Heritage Guide project. Yeah, just that we're excited for folks to tune in. This is a project that we've been working on uh, a lot of years in the making. It kind of uh, blends together uh, both the automotive and labor heritage of that region, so very much true to our mission uh, in, in Detroit's oldest and probably most densely populated neighborhoods. So we've been collecting and aggregating stories of the companies and the people and the the sites there that uh, you know really shaped the fabric of, of that and continue to stand today. So it's really a, a very contemporary story as well. So I look forward to uh, everyone joining us next week. Outstanding. And uh, again, if you, like, if you like what you saw and heard today, uh, please support us, become a member of Motor Cities National Heritage Area. Uh, you can click on the PayPal donation link and, and, and support us that way. Um, we would love to see you next week. We hope you register and join us for Motor Cities at Home, edition number seven on the Southwest Detroit guide. And so thanks again. We hope to see you next week. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.